And now, uh, Professor Norman Saul will introduce Professor Stuff. It's a pleasure to welcome uh, Laurie back to Lawrence and the University of Kansas. It seems like it was only a few days ago, <laughs> a few years ago, that I had the honor of hooding her in Murphy Hall, um, which was fortunately air conditioned because it, in contrast to today, was a <laughs> hot May day, as I recall. Um, Laurie has done well. Uh, her dissertation was published as the They Fought for the Motherland, Russian uh, Women Soldiers in World War I and the Revolution. I've got that right. <laughs> and uh, it's gone on to do another book on, uh, that was published by the University Press of Kansas, by the way. Um, another book on uh, Russia's Sisters of Mercy. Uh, on the nurses in World War I. So her work has really combined gender studies with Russian history and with military history, um, the periods especially of World War I. And because of the <coughs> centennial of the events, the revolution and the war, uh, she has been very active in uh, articles and papers and other things dealing with that uh, period and with gender studies, basically. Um, another thing that I have recruited her, actually, more recently, or this, it'll look something like that when it comes out. <laughs> it's a book uh, in this series on Americans in Revolutionary Russia. And um, uh, Malcolm Grove is the person that she's working on in his book. He was a surgeon, an American surgeon, in the Russian army during World War I. So that's one of her current projects anyway. So I, let's join in welcoming Lori back to KU. Well, uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, uh, everybody, for coming out. And, and thank you for the center for inviting me and making all the arrangements and putting me up in the lovely hotel, which the last time I was here was the glass onion and the yellow sub. <laughs> it was not a hotel, so I was, wow, uh, very surprising. Um, uh, and thank you, Professor Saul, for inviting me to come and talk about uh, what I'm working on right now, which, um, like any minute, literally, this book is going to come out. So keep your fingers crossed. Uh, and um, Professor Menning was uh, involved in this project, uh, at least as I understand, um, told uh, Tony Haywood and John Steinberg to bring me in as an editor, uh, which they did. And so I'm very grateful to him for that. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that. But yeah. <laughs> that's what they told me. <laughs> uh, so yes, this is, um, this talk is about uh, Russia's experience of the front. And you'll notice that I have the word front in quotation marks because the purpose of this project is really to help us understand what that term means and to work towards a reconceptualization um, of the idea of the front, which in the situation of Russia during World War I is quite different, uh, especially as compared to that experience of the Western front. Um, and so this is this is kind of what we're looking at. Uh, so um, as you you probably uh, well know, or many of you well know, uh, Russian historiography, especially uh, military historiography, is replete with studies of battle plans and strategies, troop movements, uh, numbers of casualties, territorial gains, and the decisions of state actors. But we know that war is really so much more than this. Uh, it is, frankly speaking, one of the most important events in the human experience, and 
ultimately said experience is profound and long lasting. Uh, and so we really need to pay attention to the humans who are involved in the war and what they are experiencing and how they are experiencing this. Uh, and so over the last uh, several decades, um, military history has, as a subfield of history, uh, along with many other sort of uh, subfields, has taken what we might call a cultural turn to examine uh, these aspects of war. Um, and I started to think about this, that this, this new military history uh, is, is really not so new. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, it was already established when I started my own graduate studies uh, uh, and now 25 years later. And, and when I wrote that, I had to stop for a second because it was really super depressing that that was 25 years ago. For me, and maybe for some of the people in this room, <laughs> that, that I started uh, my graduate work 25 years ago. But now, 25 years later, the field of new military history or or what we might call war in society is really burgeoned. Um, and so this, this work fits into uh, that, kind of, um, that kind of study. Um, so as you also may well know, uh, Russia's experience in World War I has not gotten the kind of scholarly attention that lots of um, other countries who participated in the war had. If you go into a bookstore and you just look at the shelves, you will see volumes and volumes on the British experience and a little bit less on the French, but very little on, on Russia and, until recently. And so this book is part of this effort um, that uh, is a multinational, multi-volume effort uh, called Russia's Great War and Revolution. This is one of many Many, many books that's uh, coming out it, that seeks to restore Russia's um, experience in the war and to uh, further examine it. So this is actually the first book uh, in what's going to be, I think there's five books in this military affairs in Russia's revolution and great war uh, sub-series. So this is book one. And I know that Dr. Manning is working on one, and there's several others that have to do more with strategies and things, but this one is about uh, experience. Um, so, in particular, one of the things uh, that we're really trying to do with this book uh, is to re-examine the terminology. I, so I already mentioned that this idea of the front as being something we want to examine, uh, and especially the, the dichotomy which has traditionally been created between front and rear. That these are things that you can clearly distinguish, that they are separate, that they have different kinds of war experiences. Uh, and what we're doing with this work is challenging that notion and saying, uh, it's really not uh, as clear-cut as you would think. In fact, it's very nebulous. And also the categories of actors that we normally associate with participation in war uh, that have been traditionally um, termed combatant and non-combatant. So we're, we're trying to challenge these things. We're trying to look more deeply and, and give uh, an opportunity to <laughs> offer new ways of understanding this. So this project incorporates new research methods, uh, archival sources, multimedia formats uh, in order to reconceptualize these critical concepts um, and help to bring awareness to the experiences uh, on the Russian front. Um, so I want to talk then just a little bit about these categories. So if you look at um, Russia uh, and its participation in the war on the Eastern Front, you, you immediately notice uh, that the space of the war is tremendously different uh, and, and huge as compared to, for example, again, the Western Front. The Western Front, we had this conception of war, warfare in the Great War as this stagnant trench warfare that's very much set in place and time. And that is not the case at all with the Russian experience. Uh, which is, uh, you can 
see the differences where the front lines move at different places during the war. So in all of that territory, obviously, uh, there are lots of civilians who get pulled in to this war, and they come under the jurisdiction of military authorities at different times and different places, and they get drawn into ex the experiences of the war uh, in different ways. So um, we're really kind of reconceptualizing this idea of front and rear uh, rather than something which is defined by place and space and more by temporality and functionality, right? And that, uh, by the way, I have to give credit to Dr. Menning for coming up with the, that phrasing, uh, which was so beautiful that we stole it. Uh, <laughs> um, because it, this is really kind of um, a much better way of understanding the way the war experience was um, in Russia. Uh, so we, we need to interpret this idea of front very broadly. Uh, and in fact, we hope that this is going to be one of the major contributions of this book. And as um, Bill Rosenberg, who wrote our um, conclusion to the book, said, in addressing the complexity of Russia's frontline experience between 1914 and 1918, the essays in this volume take up one of the most important, difficult, and least studied problems of Russia's great war and revolution. The term front itself is a co complex signifier. As a shifting and unstable geographic space, it connotes the fragile physical circumstance of those within its borders. As the literal borderline for many between life and death, it constitutes an emotional field of individual and collective anxiety, variously expressed in language and action, repressed or otherwise concealed, or managed in some way or other in the service of emotional and psychological stability and physical survival. As a result, the notion of the military front must be interpreted very broadly. And anticipating the Civil War years, when fighting would spread throughout the former Tsarist Empire, the front in this book extends far beyond the lines of trenches and beyond the military controlled uh, war zone. And it is in this vastly uh, different circumstances that the soldiers experience uh, and the other wartime personnel experience the war, where they lived, where they fought, where they died. So it was where medical staffs worked around the clock to administer aids to the wounded and ill, both military and civilian, because as a result of this war, there were huge dislocations of civilian populations, epidemic diseases spread. Uh, it was where railway workers were essential in moving people and goods for military services and again came under uh, military jurisdiction and it was even away from the fighting in places like POW camps so we we look at those um, various aspects of the war so this is kind of the image that we have of Russia's uh, Eastern Front it's highly mobile uh, it one way that to describe it I think really well is the way the medical personnel were constantly having to set up field hospitals one day and then the next pack up everything and move to follow the troops in order to be able to treat them. So it's, it's not at all the kind of stagnant trench warfare we think of like the West and it encroached on civilian areas quite frequently. But also prisoners of war, and there's a whole section in this book actually on prisoners of war, uh, which is uh, really interesting in kind of pushing those uh, conceptualizations of what it means to be a part of the front. Because the war experience did not end once someone was removed from the functional zone of the front and the physical fighting. So it's, again, sort of reconceptualized uh, beyond there. Uh, so this volume considers the way that prisoners of war navigated new war wartime spaces, uh, in prisoner of war camps, and as part of labor details. There's, again, a vast array of factors prove significant uh, as determinants of their experiences, not the least of which is which side of the conflict they ended up on, whose prisoner they became, because that really had a tremendous impact. The soldiers of the Russian Imperial Army who were captured and held by German and Austro-Hungarian forces found themselves in an entirely new world which they had to navigate. Um, they found often that they liked it better, even in the POW camps. Uh, and this also plays into issues of repatriation when they come back, especially after the revolution, where they expect things to be much better, and they're really not. 
It also has a lot uh, to say about the way prisoners who are held by the Russians, you know, the Germans and, and Austro-Hungarian soldiers are held by Russians. Again, conscripted into labor, so they're working for the other side. And so this book explores uh, the ways in which uh, those are important uh, experiences. So in terms of the way we're trying to reconceptualize the front, uh, it might be best to summarize it as uh, the front as po the possibility of the front being wherever military conflict had an impact on those who intersected with it. So this is not to say that the front and military experience encompassed all areas of Russian life, but that it is extremely important to consider the ways that it reached into the lives of many people and into many territorial realms that have not previously been included in the historiography and ultimately shaped their experiences of war in significantly militarized ways. The common theme here is the military character of experiences in this nebulous and fluctuating, ill-defined zone of conflict, which we can only loosely term the front. In other words, although the front was not necessarily everywhere, it could be anywhere. So the next, uh, I think, major contribution that this uh, book is going to make, at least I hope, is in reconceptualizing these ideas about actors and the terminologies that we use that to categorize them that, again, traditionally we've called combatant, non-combatant, we've drawn very distinct lines between them. We say combatants are people who fight, you know, who uh, participate in mechanized warfare, and combatants are people who don't. But again, I think that these terms are really not sufficient to capture the kinds of war experience that we see in Russia during World War I. Because from the very start of the war in the summer of 1914, there are huge and diverse swaths of, Russian, <coughs> of the Russian population that become part of the empire's military effort in a, a wide variety of ways beyond conventional uh, combat. So, and I think that this picture really encapsulates that idea <laughs> quite well. So you have soldiers with a cannon, and then you have nurses just sort of casually leaning on it as if this is totally normal, right? Of course, why wouldn't you take a picture of soldiers and nurses leaning on a cannon, right? Um, so because of the nature of the war, the total war, it was necessary for the empire to rely very heavily uh, on civilians. They could not um, just use uh, military organizations and actors to carry out the work of the war. Uh, they weren't real happy about that. The Tsarist administration was not thrilled, but they really had no choice. Um, and this made, again, people who were normally uh, categorized as civilians suddenly come under uh, sort of this military regulation, although in many instances they're not always willing to follow that, so that caused problems. Um, and there are also a large uh, range of determinants that shaped the way these individuals uh, experienced the war. Um, so again, in addition to trying to uh, kind of correct the false dichotomization between front and rear, we're trying to correct this false um, dichotomization of combatant and non-combatant. So if we look at the actors, uh, in particular if we look at the civilians, uh, we see lots of ways that challenge these traditional notions. So again, this picture I think does a great job. I know I'm kind of like uh, biased towards the nurses, but <laughs> um, so this woman, this young woman is named Rima Ivanova and she was a nurse and she was serving with a unit and then suddenly she found that all of the commanders in her unit had been killed and so she decided to lead her unit in into battle and there's a great uh, lore around her experiences so again this this sort of um, encapsulates this idea like who exactly is a combatant and who exactly uh, is not and she ends up getting killed uh, and she becomes a hero although the Germans protest because it's against the Geneva Convention for, me for medical personnel to be involved in combat but she's posthumously awarded a medal for her bravery. Uh, so again, this, this really kind of challenges that. 
But there's other really important actors um, that are addressed in this book as well. Um, some of the uh, more important ones are military chaplains. So priests who are with the um, armed forces uh, who uh, have a specific role to play. In particular, um, they are charged with promoting what has often been termed by historians as a theology of war. Uh, so their job is to shore up the morale of the troops and to convince them that they're doing the right thing for faith, for czar, for fatherland. Um, in the long term, however, efforts made by military chaplains on the Russian front uh, really failed to sustain patriotic feelings. Uh, now this may be partly because of the huge numbers of casualties uh, that brought a constant flow of new recruits uh, from the so-called rear uh, who were certainly not enthusiastic, uh, who were increasingly leery about participating in the war, and also because of the high casualty rate as a result of the use of mechanized weapons and the inability of Russian medical services to um, deal with uh, lots of, uh, of, of these kinds of wounds and eventually the high uh, level of death. So one of the main functions then of the um, military chaplains just becomes uh, consoling uh, wounded uh, and ill soldiers, because disease is also a major factor of this, and administering last rites. So that's exactly what's going on here, like en masse. All these people are sort of dying. And by the way, this is a field hospital, so that should also explode your image of what like a nice, clean, sanitary uh, medical uh, facility would, is supposed to look like. That's not necessarily how they look uh, on the Russian front. Um, and so the church uh, also now becomes heavily associated with the war and, and the idea of um, violence uh, and um at least one historian has surmised that this could have um, potentially been a factor in the anti-religious sentiments that then play into the revolution. Uh, so, so the chaplains are important uh, players for us to consider. Um, additionally, railway workers, which is uh another category of people that have not really been explored at all, but their function in the war is absolutely essential because of the size of the empire, transporting both goods and people um, to the fighting and back. Uh, and they also not only are in the line of fire, literally, they're being bombed, they're being shot at, so their, their roles are extremely dangerous. Um, they're suffering the same kind of deprivations that, that troops are. But as time goes on and the empire becomes less and less capable of getting the people and the goods to the places where they need to be and there are shortages of supplies, they be again become implicated uh, in the failures of the war and, bl and incess incessantly blamed for shortages of munitions, of food and other supplies that hinder military operations and significantly affect uh, soldiers' morale. So they, they are an integral part of this picture as well. And lastly, just I have to talk about the medical personnel, particularly um, the nurses, um, because again here it's very hard for us to draw clear lines between who is uh, directly involved and who is not. So technically medical personnel are not supposed to be near the fighting. They're supposed to stay three to four miles behind the lines, but that is just absolutely impossible because of the very mobile nature of those lines. They, they are never in one place uh, and they become victim just like soldiers to bombings and shootings and um, other um, kinds of uh, violence of the war. Uh, they also, there's a very, very high rate of uh, disease, uh, infectious disease that, that affect medical personnel. They also suffer uh, very, very similar ki kinds of psychological trauma and this is kind of one of the really interesting things about Russia during World War I is that Russian psychology, military psychology is in the forefront of treating this kind of trauma like that we often refer to as shell shock, now we call PTSD. And they're um, looking at the ways it's affecting medical personnel just as much as they're looking at um, the ways it's affecting um, soldiers. Uh, the other important aspect of medical uh, per personnel is the gendered component. Uh, nurses uh, outnumber doctors three to one. 
at the front, so they're doing uh, most of the, the medical care, um, but they're also all civilians. Russia doesn't have a professional uh, nursing corps before this war, um, and being subject to military regulations isn't necessarily something that nurses uh, want uh, or do very well. Um, furthermore, the main reason why women are recruited so heavily into military nurses is particularly because of gendered conceptions of women as caring and nurturing, but when they get to the front and they have to do the kinds of medical work that is required, they need to suppress all of that. They cannot possibly become emotionally attached uh, to the soldiers and instead they have to endure great hardship. Again, they're in danger. Um, and more shameless plugs. If if you, uh, Dr. Saul already mentioned this, but <laughs> if you're really interested in nurses, there is a book uh, that you can read. The University Press of Kansas. Um, so all of these uh, things kind of lead us to challenge the ways that we understand what it is to be a combatant, what it is to be a non-combatant. Um, the the last thing I want to talk about with regard to this book. Uh, is the ways in which the, um, the several chapters that challenge even our uh, conceptions of the sort of standardized trope of the Russian uh, soldier. Um, so that um, brings uh, into play lots of different factors like religion, nationality, and even gender, and some other determinants. Um, so the standard trope, obviously, of the Russian soldier in the Great War is male, orthodox, uh, great Russian peasant, right? who went to fight, um, perhaps as Alan Wildman famously remarked, with sullen resignation rather than overwhelmingly patriotic enthusiasm for faith, czar, and fatherland. But nonetheless, that's the image that we have, right? Uh, that's an image, obviously, that this book seeks to complicate significantly by looking at these different factors. So we look at religion. And there are chapters in this book on Jewish soldiers and Muslim soldiers, which again help to challenge this idea of what it is to be a Russian soldier in the First World War. Uh, in particular, uh, this, uh, the slogan of for, for faith, star, and fatherland becomes problematic when this is not your faith, right? So what are you exactly fighting for? Um, and even more so, uh, it's complicated for uh, Jewish and Muslim citizens who are not afforded the same rights of citizenship uh, that um, others are, and so they uh, question exactly what it is. Uh, in fact, for J Jewish soldiers, this is particularly problematic because at the same time that they, the Jewish soldiers become uh, uh, individuals who are supposed to be upholding the, the Tsarist Empire, they're being targeted as enemies of the people and essentially uh, being treated you know, extremely badly. Um, and so on the one hand, there are individuals who think this is a way for them to prove that they are good subjects and that they should be rewarded for their military service uh, in, re in return for their sacrifices. On the other hand, there are people who are arguing, why are we fighting for an empire that's essentially trying to kill us. Uh, so that becomes significantly problematic. And Muslim soldiers are also sort of trying to negotiate this same kind of territory um, and figure out what benefit comes from serving an empire that doesn't exactly look out for your interests. Uh, we also look at um, other nationalities besides the great Russian ones, and there's a great article in this book about Estonian soldiers who are also somewhat reluctant to serve an empire in which uh, they are not getting money, many benefits from, uh, and the same sort of debates are being held about whether or not they should serve, and in, maybe in return they'll, they'll get uh, rights of greater citizenship, um, or maybe they should just abandon the whole effort. Uh, and of course, I Obviously, this is going to lead into uh, the problems that are going to ex be exacerbated in the revolution. 
with nationality. And then lastly, um, we consider gender too because uh, not all of the soldiers uh, are men. There are women, at least 6,000 of them, who um, enlist in the armed forces uh, and some of them are integrated into male units, uh, usually disguised as men, but then once uh, 1917 comes around, you have the all-female uh, combatant units that are formed. Um, and so these also challenge uh, our notions of what it means to be a soldier, which has traditionally been conceptualized as a masculine endeavor. Uh, and so these, they demonstrate clearly that essentialist notions of biology uh, don't uh, work at all because they're just as capable as carrying, of carrying out the duties of a soldier um, as, as the men are, uh, and more shameless plugs. If you want to know more about the, Russia, the women soldiers, there's a book. Um, but the women, by the way, are also invested in uh, wartime service for, the, for similar reasons in that they want to see a reward for uh, that service in the form of political rights. And this is particularly poignant because Russia becomes the, great, the first great power to grant women the right to vote in July of 1917. So um, there, there is at least a corollary. I, I'm not going to say a causative factor. I can't necessarily prove that, but there are at least a corollary to um, the, the promotion of women's rights with uh, wartime service. Uh, and, and the book also explores the ways in which those soldiers that we do conceptualize as sort of traditional um, uh, in, the, in the sense of the Russian male peasant orthodox uh, soldier, how they also experience the war and the ways in which um, the war tests uh, the, the limits uh, of their patience, uh, their endurance, uh, and how they again negotiate the spaces of both the front um, and the, or the, the moving front. Um, so there are several articles in this volume that indicate the ways in which soldiers reacted to the extreme strain placed upon them, how they experienced frustrations when the state failed to fulfill its promises in return for the services uh, they provided, how they negotiated their relationship with the state. So uh, some of those articles look at, for example, censorship, um, which every soldier was subject to, right? They, when they wrote letters home, they were all reviewed um, and they learned how to write in ways that either could evade censorship uh, or in codes. Um, they all knew that their letters were being censored, which is uh, really interesting. And so it also leads us to challenge the way we understand experience as being genuine. Like, what are they, are they writing things that are actually the things they really feel and they're really experiencing? Are they writing what they think the censors want to hear or will let the, let the letters go through to their family? They're, we see weakening discipline. Um, we see instances of fraternization. So there's a really great article in this book about the ways that fraternization, obviously something that all of the belligerents experienced during this war, <coughs> but in Russia takes on a slightly different dimension. Uh, and that the main objective among Russian soldiers in fraternizing with enemy soldiers was to get better stuff because they knew they could exchange things, uh, not necessarily because they felt you know, that the war was purposeless or uh, that they had some sort of ideological uh, underpinnings or, or some feelings of mutual respect for the other soldier, but they knew the other side had better stuff uh, and they could trade. Um, desertion too gets some treatment in here and interestingly again there's been a lot of emphasis on the ways in which desertion had a major impact on the failures of the Russian army and um, this article sort of challenges that and says that desertion was not as widespread necessarily as we think and also it was often temporary so uh, soldiers weren't necessarily just getting up walking away and not coming back they would go for like a vacation right a brief period they wanted to see how their family they wanted to see what their wives were up to, right? They wanted to help out at, at home, and but then they would come back to their units. So this is a whole kind of different dimension with regard to uh, desertion. Uh, and lastly, um, the book um, 
looks at the ways in which the war has kind of these long-term implications in terms of trauma, repatriation uh, after the war, uh, the memory of the war, and, and obviously how death is dealt with and commemorated. Uh, so the experiences of no man's land, which again is a very different kind of wartime experience where the soldiers are faced with the horrors of war and where they are sort of presented with this uh, distinct challenge to the notion of history as progress, right? They just see utter devastation. Uh, they don't see things as getting better. This plays out also in issues of repatriation, as I mentioned before, when they come back after the revolution, they think things are better. They think that they have fought for something worthwhile, and they find out not only that things are not better, in many cases they're worse, uh, but also they are not welcomed back. They are not celebrated as heroes. Uh, they're often comparing experiences, especially if they've been POWs um, in uh, Austrian lands or German lands to how things were run a lot better there and the economic situation is better. Um, and they are having, they have a very difficult time uh, assimilating back into civilian society uh, once they come home. Um, uh, and how, the, again, the memory of the war is dealt with, uh, obviously the new Soviet power does not want to celebrate an imperialist war, so the soldiers uh, really have no way of sort of negotiating their experience in, in, in the war. Um, uh, and then how, the, how they deal with death, again, when you're not commemorating, when you're not building memorials um, and things like that. So um, I would just say to sort of summarize, uh, without paying sufficient attention to these factors, we really lose part of the holistic view necessary to understand this war, especially as a total war, <coughs> and its long-term implications. So this volume seeks to offer new perspectives um, on these experiences. And as, as such, it is hoped, again, in the words of Bill Rosenberg, that the essays in this collection will make a quantum leap forward in addressing addressing the complex dimensions of the experience of war on the Russian front. Thank you.